Community is healing. Community is how we carry on together. It was a crime that rocked a small college town and captured the attention of the world. This horrible crime has affected all of us. Four University of Idaho students murdered in a house near campus. But these girls were absolutely beautiful. They've been friends since sixth grade. It's a shame and it hurts. Some feared the murders of Maddie Mogan, Kaylee Gonsalves, Ethan Chapin, and Zana Kernodal would never be solved. Who would want to hurt these four students sleeping in their house? The answer, police would later say, was this man. This is State of Idaho versus Brian C. Koberger. Brian Koberger, a PhD student in criminology who lived 10 miles away. But why? That's just one of so many questions that remain more than one year later as we remember the four Idaho students taken too soon. I'm Antoinette Levy. Thank you for joining us as we remember the four University of Idaho students senselessly murdered in Moscow, Idaho more than a year ago. It's been one year since police made an arrest in the case. Maddie Mogan, Kelly Gonsalves, Ethan Chapin, and Zana Kernodal had their entire lives ahead of them. But on November 13th, 2022, their lives were taken, police say by this man, Brian Koberger, a criminology PhD student who lived 10 miles away across the Washington state line in Pullman. As we look back a year later, we want to remember the four victims by telling you who they were, what we know about the investigation, the evidence, and what lies ahead. No matter where you find yourself tonight, the Vandal family is here. And on this day, across all of Idaho, we are all Vandals. Students, fellow classmates of Maddie Mogan, Kaylee Gonsalves, Ethan Chapin, and Zana Kernodal came together on a lawn at the school in Moscow this past November 13th to remember their friends one year later. Maddie was a bright person. She had a bright smile. She had a bright future. Maddie was bright. She was bright in every way that a person could be. Maddie was the kind of person that made sure everyone felt welcomed and cared for. It was nearly impossible to not be smiling when you were around her. I am reminded every day to live like Kaylee would. Be more spontaneous, stop and take pictures, be loud, laugh loud, and love hard. May we all work hard to be more like Kaylee. The students also want to try to start the difficult process of healing as they grieve the loss of their friends. A beautiful aura followed her everywhere she went. There was always a smile on her face. She was a very contagious person. Zana was one of those people that you could not possibly be sad around. She made friends feel unapologetic for being themselves. He so effortlessly put anyone and everyone around him in a good mood. These traits are something I strive to obtain every single day. A little more than a year ago, on November 12, 2022, everything seemed normal in Moscow, Idaho. The leaves were changing colors. It was nearly a perfect warm fall day. Students Maddie Mogan, Kaylee Gonsalves, Zana Kernodal, and Ethan Chapin posed for a photo with two roommates before the big football game. Back to the formation. Vandals return to the big sky. And that's his first rushing touchdown of the season. Later that night, Zana and Ethan went to a party at his fraternity, Sigma Chi, just a few blocks from the home where she lived with Maddie Kaylee and two other young female students. Hi. Welcome back. James, I think I would like the... Um... That night, a Twitch video from the grub truck recorded Kaylee and Maddie ordering food around 1.30 a.m. after hanging out at the Corner Club bar. Cool. Thank you. Maddie and Kaylee hung out for a few minutes, doing what college kids do, looking at Kaylee's phone, at one point taking a selfie. Minutes later, the lifelong friends walked away, a guy in a white hoodie trailing behind. Kaylee and Maddie took a rideshare home. The driver told me he had driven Kaylee, Maddie, and Zana home many times. 
He said they were all nice, happy, friendly girls. That morning, he dropped off Kaylee and Maddie just before 2 a.m. Police would later say Zana received a food delivery at 4 a.m. and her phone showed she was on TikTok at 4.12 a.m. A short time after that, Moscow police believed Maddie, Kaylee, Ethan, and Zana were attacked and killed. Hours later, two roommates awoke. Then came a call to 911, and the home on King Road that had been the scene of so many parties became a crime scene. We know that the autopsies confirmed the identity of the four victims, determined the cause and manner of death as a homicide by stabbing, and determined that it was likely all four victims who were asleep during the attack. Some of the victims had defensive wounds, and each victim was stabbed multiple times. There was no sign of sexual assault. Based on details at the scene, we believe this was an isolated, targeted attack on our victims. The brutality of this crime in this small college town of 25,000 was unbelievable. It, it was so scary. We were just like, who could have done this? So yeah, it was a lot of fear. It was so sad. Um, and then you saw the photos of those beautiful, you know, young people over and over and over again. Cindy Hollenbeck lives in Pullman, Washington nearby and has two college age children. This is a place where we don't lock our doors, you know, and I started locking, checking every single night. Um, I was in so much fear. People around the state of Idaho started following the story and then around the world. It was so senseless. These young adults were in the prime of their lives. And, uh, you know, that last photo that has made kind of rounds of all of them smiling and, and standing outside really I think sticks in people's minds as well. And, and we're all still grieving the loss. But who would stab these four students and why? Stabbing is such a personal crime. And, and you have to be so close to do it. Dr. Angela Arnold is a psychiatrist who has followed the case. She tried to figure out what could motivate someone to attack Maddie, Kaylee, Ethan, and Zana in their home in the middle of the night and stabbing all four in possibly a short amount of time. I also have to wonder when someone does something like this and it's so brutal, how much of a sexual undertone it has to it and what kind of sexual pleasure he got from performing this. As the days and weeks passed, it seemed as if police had little to go on. It would be a daunting task, trying to figure out who killed the four students. The house where the murders happened was on Greek Row, just off campus. Not a lot of cars, a, don a ton of uh, traffic, foot traffic. A lot of students like to live over here and then just walk to classes. Max Keim lived directly across the street from the house on King Road and spoke to police several times. The officers asked Kime about noise coming from the house. Lots of partying going on in Moscow, Idaho. So uh, if there was a lot of yelling and screaming, I'm sure I slept right through it because there always is. And that was the best I could tell any officers. Days after the murders, family and friends of Kaylee, Maddie, Ethan, and Zana gathered to pray and to remember them. <laughs> Madison, Maddie May, she was, uh, she's, She was the first uh, granddaughter, grandkid of any of her grandparents. Uh, she was Karen and my only child that we ever had. Maddie Mogan's father, Ben, said she was a hard worker who made the Dean's List every semester. Her family said she loved anything pink and sparkly, and she was loved. And uh, she was so, she was just, such a happy, just a, such a great kid, such a perfect little baby, and so just smart and funny and beautiful. Maddie was a member of the Pi Beta Phi sorority where she had many friends who loved her. She was easily the best person that I knew. She loved everyone around her more than life. Um, she loved her mom. She always told me, don't you think my mom's so cute and so pretty? Kaylee's parents also took the stage to talk about her and Maddie. I want everyone to know 
These girls were absolutely beautiful. They had been friends since sixth grade. So then they went to high schools together. Then they started looking at colleges. They came here together. They eventually get into the same apartment together. And in the end, they died together in the same room, in the same bed. Ethan Chapin was a triplet. His siblings, Maisie and Hunter, attended the University of Idaho with him. His mother, Stacy, talking about the memories the family shared. We surfed and spent countless hours in our boat listening to country music, which was Ethan's most favorite thing in the whole world. We hiked. Typically, the kids did that reluctantly, I'll admit. Hi, my name is Zana Kernodal. Zana Kernodal was Ethan Chapin's girlfriend and a roommate of Maddie and Kaylee. Like Ethan, she was only 20 years old. She was majoring in marketing. By all accounts, Ethan was Zana's first boyfriend. He had such an infectious smile and a charismatic personality. And if you knew anything about Zana as well, they were very similar in how they acted together. Gripped with fear, many students went home to finish the semester online. Others stayed in their dorms, going to class on Zoom. Was a person capable of killing four people walking among them? Who was it? And would he ever be found? There were just too many questions unanswered for anyone to feel truly safe. Coming up, inside the search for a killer and how police say they tracked down the man who murdered four students with a retired FBI agent and a death investigator. You are watching Law and Crime. The house on King Road had gone from a happy place with a good vibe sign hanging on the wall where college kids made memories to a horrific crime scene in a matter of hours, maybe even minutes. The four were stabbed with a knife, but no weapon has been located at this time. There was no sign of forced entry into the residence. The Moscow Police Department, with just 36 officers, had an overwhelming task ahead of them as they tried to figure out who killed Maddie Mogan, Kelly Gonsalves, Ethan Chapin, and Zana Kernodal. So where do police begin? Uh, that, this actual slaughter that took place, so it is a huge, huge undertaking. Veteran forensic death investigator Joseph Scott Morgan has followed the murders in Idaho closely from the beginning. Morgan describes the challenges of investigating the three-story house on King Road. For anybody that's had a collegiate experience where there's um, off-campus housing involved, many times there's an open door policy, and particularly if you've got multiple roommates. Hey guys, Bosco PD. Hey. hey, turn the music down. The door appeared to always be open at all times at the house on King Road. Hello, Hello. miss. What's your name? Zana. Zana, do you live here? Yes. The house where Zana, Kaylee, and Maddie lived with their two roommates was a popular party house. How are you? After the murders, several body camera videos from Moscow police surfaced, showing officers went to King Road several times after neighbors called, complaining about noise coming from the house. We're only here for a noise complaint. Come to the damn door. Kaylee Gonsalves spoke to the officers nearly three months before she, Maddie, Ethan, and Zana were murdered. You know why we're here? Uh, and I assume noise. Noise, yeah. Yeah. Big speaker right there. Yeah. Because this is such an involved scene, and I don't, I don't know if I can impress upon viewers how extensive this thing is uh, when you're talking about a multi-story dwelling. Morgan says the three-story house was like a petri dish when it comes to DNA and other vital evidence that could point to a suspect or suspects. And you might have, you know, parties and get-togethers all together, but then you have these collections of people that are coming in, and of course they're depositing everything uh, that that they bring from outside with them. Uh, you know, and it, so it's not just to the exclusion of that individual's personal DNA. Anything else relative to trace evidence, um, you know, you begin to think about hair, fiber, footprints. That fact alone could make collecting evidence a challenge and later trying to make sense of it once results come in from the lab. Morgan says the crime scene 
includes more than just the house where the students were killed. You're talking about a neighborhood where you have people that uh, are domiciled immediately adjacent to this standalone structure. Everything must be considered. Couple the complexity of the crime scene with the fact that the quadruple murder happened in a city with a small police department that doesn't investigate many murders, and you could run into some real problems. Crime knows no boundaries, and these murders have shaken us to our very core. Let's face it, Moscow police knew right away they were in over their heads and immediately called for help. We have 25 plus investigators working this case, as well as assistance from the Federal Bureau of Investigation and the Idaho State Police. We're reviewing video that has been collected, but we are asking citizens to contact us with any information you may have that will help in this investigation. Police held press conferences, releasing bits and pieces of information to a community full of people who were living in fear. We do not have a suspect at this time, and that individual is still out there. One critical piece of information that police shared, they knew the murder weapon was a knife, but they didn't know where it was or who owned it. Word started to spread around the small town that police were going to local shops, asking about a specific knife, a K-bar knife. Very heavy. Um, it is a combat knife. It's been used by our troops since World War II famously by the United States Marine Corps. So how did police know exactly what they were looking for? In late 2022, that wasn't clear. But what you could easily find out is that anyone could go online and buy a K-Bar knife. And that's very specific. Folks that didn't see it, there's the word, K-Bar. It actually is uh, what's referred to as uh, a bastardization of, of the words, kill a bear. And that's how far it goes back. And so the knife was considered to be that robust as a combat knife. Um, you show up with a knife like this, you know, it, it kind of implies that you're, you're showing up with, let's say, some level of homicidal intent. It appeared police, even with the help of the FBI, had little, if anything, to go on. Because what happens in the beginning of a case like that, you don't know what's what. You don't know where to go. So you're just trying to stay in the investigative mindset so that once you get that break, whatever that break is that you were alluding to, like what that was, what was that one thing, um, you want to be able to be in a position so when that one thing happens, you can exploit it and you can take advantage of it. The investigation moved forward slowly, day by day, with few details released. That didn't stop people from talking, though, about the case. There was something about it and the victims that seemed to strike people. People seem to have an insatiable curiosity to know who killed Kaylee, Maddie, Ethan, and Zana, and why. Murphy, you've been a bad boy! <laughs> No one could seem to understand how or why this happened to these four people who seemed so happy, their entire lives ahead of them. They seemed happy on social media, and people felt like they knew them or could have known them, as if the four could have been their sisters or daughters or brother or son. Ethan, Glitchy Gritty! Gritty, Gritty, Gritty! Oh my God, that sucks. That may have been part of the reason that so many people took an interest. Amateur sleuths on the internet went searching for leads anywhere they could find them. Hey guys, Moscow PD, come over here, talk to me. Every piece of video, and I'm talking every piece of video, came under scrutiny. You got trade on you? I don't. Okay, yes. I'm gonna grab your info just because you got beer and you're walking around with it. Even students walking around the area the morning of the murders became possible suspects, along with anyone seen near the area. And remember Hoodie Guy from the food truck? He became the target of online sleuths just for being there, leading police to take the unusual step of announcing who wasn't considered a suspect. We do not believe the following individuals are involved in this crime. The two surviving roommates, a male seen at the grub truck food vendor downtown, specifically wearing a white hoodie a private party who provided uh, rides home to Kaylee and Madison in the early morning hour of November 13th. 
Did you feel like the amateur sleuth stuff was harmful in this case? You know, it can be. Um, I know that uh, there are probably a lot of well-meaning people out there who were just trying to be helpful to law enforcement, provide the tips that they, you know, that they saw. You know, the times have changed as well. We have access to so much information and videos and data. Days and weeks passed without an arrest. Then came Thanksgiving and the beginning of December. So as this is an ongoing criminal investigation, uh, there's not a lot of new information that we're able to provide. That was December 7th. A short time after that interview, police revealed the first new piece of information in many days. Moscow police put out a description of a vehicle. It's a white Hyundai Elantra between the years of 2011 and 2013. This vehicle was apparently seen in the area of the King Road home where the four students were murdered. Certainly, it's the biggest lead, I think, from uh, from the perspective of specificity, isn't it? You know, I, I don't know about you guys, mm -hmm. but uh, yesterday when this dropped, I automatically tweeted that retweeted this out, you know, and said that this is uh, this is breaking news. That breaking news set off a frenzy and a nationwide hunt for a white Hyundai Elantra. Where was the car and who was behind the wheel and what clues might that white Elantra hold? that the occupant or occupants of that vehicle uh, potentially saw or heard or, or know something about this case. After several days, it appeared the search for that white Elantra was going nowhere. Or was it? It is a white Hyundai Elantra in this photo and photographs without license plates and front end damage. Photos of a white Elantra with broken windows and front end damage found abandoned in Eugene, Oregon, started making the rounds on the internet Oddly enough, police didn't seem that interested and said they knew about the vehicle and were looking into it. Police would later say that the car wasn't connected, another apparent dead end. Little did the public know that something was developing quite quickly behind the scenes. Police actually had their eyes on another Hyundai Elantra and its owner across the country. We begin with that breaking news in this grisly murder case. A 28-year-old man Brian Koberger is now under arrest in connection with the killings. The news came right before the new year. I can share with you that he is a graduate student, Washington State University, and has an apartment residence over at Pullman. So who is Brian Koberger, the man accused of murdering the four students? And what is his connection to them? An expert and some who knew him weigh in. That's next. The murders of Maddie, Kaylee, Zana, and Ethan changed life on campus in Moscow. You know, before people were very rowdy, sort of outgoing, uh, and then they just started to keep to themselves a little bit more. The fact that the killer of the homicide may have been someone closely related, it always just throws out um, a little bit of doubt. As students finished classes for the semester, the campus had pretty much emptied out. Maybe half the people show up at best and everyone else is online. A killer was on the loose and no one knew who it was or if he, she, or they were still around. The people who were still in town were on high alert and so were police. I came here because it's a safe campus. So it was part of my reasoning for coming here. It's not like a lot of other colleges where uh, a lot of people are out at night and it's really dangerous, you know, like a really dangerous urban area. It's kind of out in the middle of nowhere. Before Christmas in downtown Moscow, just the sight of a police car made you wonder, did they find him? Police cars certainly drew our attention one afternoon. Around Christmas in 2022, a couple of us here at Law and Crime were hearing that the investigation was intensifying. There had been some kind of break in the case with an arrest possibly coming. It could be days or it could be weeks. But officially, we couldn't get a confirmation. Things in the investigation, at least publicly, were quiet, almost too quiet, but it was Christmas time. Then on December 29th, Moscow Police Chief James Fry posted a video message. Um, we've received over 19,650 tips. We want to thank the community for all their help and help thank everybody across the nation for the help that they've given us. At that moment, the public didn't know that Chief Fry was keeping a big secret. An arrest was just hours away, so that thank you to everyone across the nation for their help 
seemed to take on new meaning the very next morning. A man has been arrested in the Poconos in connection with the murders of four college students in Idaho. His name? Brian Koberger, a 28-year-old PhD student home for the holidays with his family in Pennsylvania. The FBI and state police surrounded the house owned by Koberger's parents early that morning. Mr. Koberger was taken into custody without incident. The scene was turned over to the FBI evidence response team for processing. The neighborhood in the Poconos was effectively shut down as police searched the house and seized Koberger's white Elantra. I can share with you that he is a graduate student at Washington State University and has an apartment residence over in Pullman. Pullman is just a 10 minute drive from King Road, yet Koberger was taken into custody 2,500 miles away. Prosecutors and investigators might have their man in custody, but that didn't mean they had all of the answers they wanted. Y'all now know the name of the person who has been charged with these offenses. Please get that information out there. Please ask the public, anyone who knows about this individual, to come forward, call the tip line, report anything you know about him to help the investigators and eventually our office and the court system understand fully everything there is to know about not only the individual, but what happened and why. There really wasn't much information about Brian Koberger on social media, but what could be found raised more questions. The day of Koberger's arrest, I found an Instagram account in which he appeared to follow Maddie Mogan and Kaylee Gonsalves. The account appeared authentic. He followed others with the name Koberger. Law enforcement won't comment on the authenticity of the account because of a gag order. That account was later removed. Then there was the survey directed to ex-cons posted on Reddit asking questions such as, how did you feel when you committed a crime? How did you travel to and enter the location that the crime occurred? And why did you choose that victim or target over others? I don't think a degree in criminal justice helps anyone get away with murder. Josh Ferraro was in biology class at DeSales University in Pennsylvania with Brian Koberger. One detail that seemed to stand out about Koberger's time at DeSales, his time in a class taught by Dr. Katherine Ramsland. I have a class in dangerous minds that I teach at the undergraduate and graduate level, and that is really about extreme offenders, which is mass murderers, spree killers, and serial killers. Dr. Ramsland is a world-renowned expert on serial killers. Most notably, she wrote a book with Dennis Rader, The BTK Killer. His fantasy life is what propelled him. He was thinking all about these things and imagining himself as one of those elite serial killers. I've interviewed Dr. Ramslin a couple of times about other serial killers, but to date, she isn't commenting on her former student, Brian Koberger. But a student who was in Ramslin's class with Koberger told me he remembered him speaking to her and another professor in a superior manner as if he knew more about the subject matter than she did. The former student said Koberger didn't participate in any of the extracurricular activities, such as the Criminal Justice Club. I don't think he's the smartest guy in the room. I don't think he's amazing. I don't think he's super special. Um, he definitely has some intelligence, but so does everybody else at the sales. After the new year, Koberger appeared in court in Pennsylvania. The attorney who represented him for the proceeding told me Koberger initially waived his right to counsel and agreed to speak with police after his arrest. But then he asked for a lawyer. I mean, his family's distraught. They're shocked by the arrest. Uh, they are in constant contact with him still. I believe they're talking daily on the phone. Monroe County Public Defender Jason Labar represented Koberger for four days in Pennsylvania. He was engaged with the conversations. He was aware of what plans I had, and, and he was good with everything that I laid out for him, including the statement, uh, the statement of him being exonerated. As Koberger touched down in Idaho to answer to the murder charges, the evidence police claimed to have against him would become more clear. A probable cause affidavit described a detective finding a tan leather knife sheath stamped K-Bar USMC on it next to Maddie Mogan's body. That's how police knew what the murder weapon was. Testing of the sheath revealed a single source of DNA from a male on its snap. The affidavit said agents pulled trash from the home of Koberger's parents 
and found it was a 99.9% certainty the DNA on the sheath came from someone who was the biological son of the person whose DNA was found in the trash, meaning Brian Koberger's father. That revelation raised questions. How did investigators know where to look for Koberger's DNA? Genetic genealogy was created by the citizen scientist community. It didn't come from traditional science or academia or forensic science. C.C. Moore is a pioneer in the field of genetic genealogy, where DNA and genealogy have been used to crack cold cases. Think the Golden State Killer in California. Genetic genealogists like Moore take a DNA sample and use databases to build family trees. We are typically working with a dozen matches, two dozen matches, even more. And we're trying to connect to multiple branches of someone's family tree. And that is where we're able to really narrow it down. We later learned the FBI worked with Othram Labs to develop the profile that led to Koberger. For instance, in this case, if they were able to connect matches to his father's side and his mother's side, that would have led them directly to him. We also learned more from body camera footage. On December 15th, 2022, Brian Koberger and his dad were on the move, driving from Washington to Pennsylvania. Hello. How you doing? How y'all doing today? Good, good. At this point, it doesn't appear that Brian Koberger was on law enforcement's radar, at least not officially. That would happen about a week later. You right up on the back end of that van, hold you over for tailgating. Is this your car? Okay. Jason Labar told me that Koberger and his dad making that long drive from Washington to Pennsylvania for the holidays was a trip that had been planned months in advance. Driving hours. Hours, days. Hours to drive to our yeah. almost a day. That deputy let the Kobergers go with a warning, but eight minutes later. <laughs> Brian Koberger and his father were stopped again. The FBI would later say that those two traffic stops in Indiana had nothing to do with the murder investigation in Idaho. Hello, Hello, I am Officer Loengus. Stops being audio and video recorded. Koberger actually has a history of being pulled over. Just one month before the murders, a Washington State University officer stopped him. I think you know why I stopped you. He ran the red light. What actually happened was I was stuck in the middle of the intersection. Yeah, so I, was I was behind you the, the whole left. time. Yeah. Yeah. We later found out that Koberger had actually tried to get an internship at the Pullman Police Department that fall. He said in his application he wanted to help rural law enforcement agencies better collect and analyze technological data. He didn't get the job. Pullman police won't say why, and the department will not release his application. Koberger was a PhD student in criminology at Washington State University and a teaching assistant. Following his arrest, police searched his office in Wilson Short Hall. Some students described him as a harsh grader. Former friends said Koberger struggled with a heroin addiction in high school, but he eventually got clean. He also struggled with his weight, but took up running late at night, according to friends, and dropped the weight. A neighbor at his apartment in Pullman told me Koberger was certainly a night owl. We, we heard, you know, we heard loud sounds during the night. Yeah. A lot of, many times. Like clean the floor sometimes, vacuum, it's very loud sound. Moscow police said the night of the murders, Koberger was definitely up late. His cell phone records showing he left his apartment at 2.42 a.m. His car spotted by several surveillance cameras driving toward Moscow. Then from 2.47 to 4.48 a.m., there was no activity on his cell phone. Prosecutors say that two-hour time period covers the time when the murders happened. Koberger's late-night habits will become important later. Up next, more on the case against Brian Koberger and how he might challenge it, along with where the case stands as the victims' families try to move forward as they grieve.
as Brian Koberger made the flight from Pennsylvania to face the four murder charges, questions surrounded his involvement in the crime and his arrival drew a crowd at the Lataw County Jail. Well, we come over here a lot and stuff and it's just scary, you know, going out in public, not knowing who's around you and what they're capable of doing and stuff. You know, this guy looked like a typical person, you know, going to college and stuff and, and turns out, you know, he did this horrendous crime. Koberger was booked into the jail, the sheriff holding him in isolation for his own safety and accommodating his strict vegan diet. The details of what police claimed happened that night in November 2022 sounded like something out of a horror movie. The probable cause affidavit claimed Koberger's white Elantra was seen circling the area of the house in the 30 minutes before the murders, and that shockingly, one of the surviving roommates saw the killer, a man with bushy eyebrows wearing all black, his face covered. She said that he walked toward and past her after hearing what she thought was Kaylee Gonsalves playing with her dog upstairs then she heard someone crying and a person saying, it's okay, I will help you. According to one of the surviving roommates, the murderer went upstairs first to a specific bedroom that belonged to Maddie Mogan. So does that lead us to believe that maybe she was the target and the others would have been collateral damage? Yeah, I, I think I think so. I think you're right. I think that that's a, that's a proper conclusion, I think, that can be drawn from what we know right now. Sadly, Kaylee's parents would later say she had moved out of the King Road home and went back to Moscow only to spend time with her friends that weekend and to show off her new car. The killer, if he indeed went to Maddie's room first looking for her, may have been surprised to find both Kaylee and Maddie in the room and then surprised again to find Xana still awake downstairs after getting her DoorDash order at 4 a.m. Police said cell phone records showed that Brian Koberger had been in the area of the King Road house a dozen times in the months before the murders. He was even pulled over in August, a couple of miles from the house. But after the day of the murders, Moscow police said Koberger's cell phone records showed he never returned to Moscow. Less than two months after the murders, Brian Koberger was in a courtroom in Moscow, listening to the charges against him. The maximum penalty for that offense, if you plead guilty or are found guilty, is up to death and or imprisonment for life. Do you understand? Yes. Prosecutors later announced they were seeking the death penalty. And Ms. Taylor, is Mr. Koberger prepared to plead to these charges? What are the old sins? Judge John Judge entered a not guilty plea on Koberger's behalf. His defense team's efforts to have the indictment thrown out failed. Well, honestly, I think they really have an uphill battle on the defense of this case. Everything that we know right now uh, seems to point that he's the one who committed this crime. Attorney Tara Malik says the case against Koberger is compelling. The knife sheath that had the DNA on it, that knife sheath was found underneath one of the victim's bodies. Now, the job of a defense attorney and a good defense attorney is to look at all that evidence and to find where assumptions were made and uh, leaps of logic were made. Even Jason Labar, Koberger's public defender for a few days in Pennsylvania, agrees. The state's case looks convincing from what we know now. Uh, it's a strong circumstantial case. However, Labar believes the case is defendable. But the evidence, when it's viewed individually, you can attack that evidence as a defense attorney. Uh, but if you take the DNA evidence that's recovered from the sheath, for instance, uh, I believe that to potentially be touch DNA, transfer DNA, uh, which would mean that it could remain on that sheath for an indefinite period of time if undisturbed. Forensic death investigator Joseph Scott Morgan on the sheath. It would be clicked over and over again to get access, and it's just kind of actuating the snap. It's important to note the public doesn't know the source of the DNA on the snap of the sheath. If it is touch DNA, which is generally associated with dead, sloughing skin cells, this is a perfect place to harvest it from because it can act actually be kept caught uh, in this location and, and kind of protected in that area because it's underneath this lip. The sheath is a major piece of evidence, no doubt, and leaving it behind was a colossal mistake on the killer's part. I mean, you can imagine someone over these two victims and then dramatically they drop the sheath down, they're still holding the knife and then they go into attack. 
And it's such a frenzied event. They bolt out of the room and leave the sheath behind. As far as the public knows, the murder weapon has not been recovered. It certainly hadn't been late last year, the last time police spoke about it before the gag order had been issued. And police haven't said whether they've found evidence that Koberger ever purchased a K-Bar knife, although they have sought records for many of his accounts. The defense has said nothing publicly about this case. The only comments Brian Koberger's attorneys have made have been in court or in filings. But some of what has been stated has been interesting to say the least. First, the defense has said there's no connection between Koberger and the victims. So was that Instagram account that we showed you earlier indeed his? And another interesting claim. The defense says there was no blood or DNA of the victims found in Koberger's apartment, his home, his office, and most importantly, his white Hyundai Elantra. And finally, when asked for an alibi by prosecutors, the defense has only said that Koberger was out driving at the time of the murders. That's an interesting concession as his cell phone records clearly show him on the move in the middle of the night. But where exactly they may claim he was at the time of the murders remains a mystery. The Facebook groups were buzzing about Koberger's arrest, but one profile had seemingly vanished. His name? Papa Roger. Papa Roger seemed to have a lot of information about the crime scene that seemed intimate, almost too familiar. And look at his profile photo. It had an eerie resemblance to Brian Koberger. Many believe that Papa Roger is Brian Koberger. Much like the Reddit survey and the Instagram account, Papa Roger's profile disappeared following Koberger's arrest. There was a lot of speculation that Papa Roger was actually the killer, talking about the crime online for a sick thrill. But I can tell you, Papa Roger is most certainly not Brian Koberger. Earlier this year, the Papa Roger profile became active again. I added Papa Roger as a friend and he accepted. I've reached out a couple of times and received no response. There's really so little that's known about other evidence in the case because most of the motions have been filed under seal. It's been a source of frustration for Kaylee Gonsalves' family. I, I think they felt like there would be a much more open line of communication um, with the Lataw County Prosecutor's Office than there really is. Attorney Shannon Gray represents the Gonsalves. We don't get any information. We don't have any information on the case. We don't get any additional facts. A trial date has not been set, but when the trial does happen, the jury will not be taken to the house on King Road. The university says the house is coming down so the students can start to heal. It's a move the Kernodal and Gonsalves families oppose. And I think everyone in America <laughs> understands that. Like, why not just leave the house where it is? If you don't need it, great, right? Um, then, you know, the trial goes and you demo it after the trial. Three days after Christmas, more than a year after the murders, the home on King Road was knocked down after a final okay to the university from the prosecution team. The site of Moscow's nightmare is now an empty space, the house just a memory. The FBI had already gone back to the house to take final measurements for exhibits for trial. I wouldn't be surprised. If, if the FBI ends up building a complete scale to scale model of that house at a facility in Virginia that I used to work at. It's a huge warehouse, looks like a Hollywood soundstage and, and they build houses in there. Bobby Chacon believes that could help the jury understand how the killer moved through the house along with the testimony of the surviving roommates. A lot of this case is gonna revolve around movement within that house. How he got in, I think that's gonna be paramount because what was heard by those surviving roommates, housemates. And so I think a scale model of that house and showing how he moved and the prosecution's theory of you know, where he went first and second and third, I think is going to be very, very important for the prosecution and to the jury. So many questions remain. Perhaps the most important question though is why? Will the families ever know why their loved ones were attacked in the middle of the night in a home where they felt safe? The families, though, are doing the best they can to move forward. Ethan Chapin's mother has written a book entitled The Boy Who Wore Blue about her son, whom she dressed in blue to distinguish him from his triplets. His family has also set up the Ethan Smiles Foundation to pay for scholarships for others to the university.
Maddie Mogan's family established Maddie May Day and asked people to perform random acts of kindness on her birthday. And university students are designing a vandal healing garden and memorial. At graduation this year, the university awarded all four posthumous diplomas. This is a moment for us to acknowledge the contributions they've made and celebrate their academic achievement with their families here today. Zana received a certificate in marketing, Ethan in recreation, sports, and tourism management. Kaylee's siblings accepted her degree in general studies. She was supposed to graduate a month after she was murdered and planned to move to Texas for a new job. And finally, Maddie's parents accepted her bachelor's degree in business. Four young people who will be forever young, their lives cut short before they ever really began. Law and Crime will follow this case every step of the way, providing coverage on all of our platforms. Thank you for joining us. I'm Anjanette Levy. We will see you soon.